MechBlaze Studios will continue. I've been gone because I've been dealing with a serious medical emergency in my immediate family and the hospital visits decimated my ability to make videos. However, recent quarantine type events have given me a lot of free time, so I'm back. Also, you guys are apparently the most patient fan base on earth, and for that, I'd like to thank each and every one of you. With all that out of the way as quickly as possible, let's get to the video proper. Greetings and salutations, this is Brian from MechBlade Studios. A little while back we took a look at all the Bionicle films, from the fun but flawed Mask of Light, the well-aged classic Legends of Metro Nui, the edgy but thin Web of Shadows, and the deservedly criticized but unfairly mauled Legend Reborn. A few months after that last one was released, LEGO announced that the Bionicle toy line would draw to a close in 2010, with one final wave of sets using the maligned Avmatoran build released, but giving the story an ending. Long story short, Matsunui and Makuta fight, and thanks to the united efforts from heroes from across the franchise, Matsunui wins, peace is achieved. Greg Farsty continued the story for a while afterwards online, but other time commitments meant the story remained unfinished, leaving a lot of characters in precarious positions to this day. In 2014, after a leak that nobody thought would happen, LEGO announced Bionicle's return. They made a big deal out of it, making it the focus of its booth at New York Comic Con that year. They showed off the new sets using the building system of Bionicle's successor, Hero Factory used, which heralded the return of the classic Toa Mata in reimagined forms. The story was also revealed to be a hard reboot, depending on who you asked. One source said that there may or may not be a connection to the original story, but it was never addressed in a concrete fashion. The connection was through the Mask of Time, where while G1 had this lower half mask, G2 has this upper half. It's only used to predict the future in some of the Toa, and the connection to G1 is never explained. This review is going to be a little similar to the trilogy video where we look at multiple pieces of media given that there isn't that much to cover. We'll begin with the online webisodes from 2015. Throughout 2015, a series of 2D animations served as Bionicle D2's main story medium. While the art style was neat, taking some inspiration from Minog, they showed that the new story was told in a drastically different manner than the original. The animations were only a minute and a half long. Characters were limited to one-note personalities. Tahu's tough, Gali's nice, Lee was snarky, Onu was jolly, Pohatu's edgy, what the fuck, and Kopaka's a sundere. I didn't slip. Their adversaries were the easily defeatable Skull Spiders, the random and equally beatable Lord of Skull Spiders, and later the easily beatable Skull Villains, the summer wave of sets for that year. The backstory has elements of the previous one in a different context. A long time ago, two mask makers, Akimu and Makuta, were a big deal on the island of Okoto. Ikimu wore the Mask of Creation, and Makuta wore the Mask of Control. Makuta envied his brother's popularity and forged the Mask of Ultimate Power. The Mask, illegally combining all six elements, took control of him, turning him evil. Ikimu knocked the Mask off his face, causing all three legendary masks and Makuta to disappear, and Ikimu to fall into a coma. Skull Spiders started attacking the island, and so the Protectors summoned the Toa from the sky to save them. The Toa find their corresponding gold mask, join up to beat the bad guys, wake up Ikimu, beat more bad guys, guys and recover the mask of creation. Now if it sounds like I'm skipping over anything, I'm really not. Lego, trying to avoid locking out casual audiences with overcomplicated lore, dumbed down the story drastically. In some ways, I can agree with the sentiment. Masks in Generation 1 were called Kanohi, and each had their own name. The Mask of Light from the first film, for example, was called the Kanohi Ovoki. Instead, LEGO just went with simple terms like Mask of Creation, Mask of Fire, and so on. That gets a point across just fine, I can agree with that much. However, LEGO took the simplification to such an extreme that outside the Six Toa and the Backstory Brothers, NOBODY ELSE HAD A NAME! The main villain for that year was literally just named Skull Grinder. The third book gave him the name Kulta, but nearly every source of media seemed to clash with each other in some manner. By the way, there's only one voice actor voicing every single character like an audiobook. Yes, including Gali. Stop it, you idiots! I'm admittedly going to have a hard time scoring today's subjects because of weighing what they try to accomplish with re resources they have versus the final result. So overall, I give the animations a 4 out of 10. The runtimes aren't what bother me. They work well enough binge together as one big video, but the single voice actor, the stilted action, and the barebones story, if you can even call it barebones, drag these down a lot. I only give them a tiny bit of credit for the neat art style and the character designs, and admittedly, the meme value that they give. They gave me my shirt, by the way. I 
can feel the power! They would be perfectly serviceable if they came out consistently and without leaks, and if they had hired even just a random female intern for Golly. LEGO then announced that a four-episode CGI miniseries would be released on Netflix for the next year's story called Bionicle Journey to One. The series actually has five episodes. The first one is a quick recap of the prior year with a clip show of the 2015 animations. It's a nice way to tie the animations to current events and show them to anybody that didn't bother to go to the website or YouTube to watch them. Now that we're in the show proper, let's talk about visuals. The character designs fall somewhere between the design philosophies of the Miramax trilogy and The Legend Reborn, leading slightly towards the latter. They're mostly set accurate with adjustments made to bulk up thin parts or work around bizarre choices made in the set designs. They don't have mouths like either of the movie design types communicating with flashing eyes. All the models are cell shaded, but they don't always blend well with their 2D surroundings. The action ranges from serviceable to surprisingly good, like this scene with Leo vs. Umarak. The voice acting is unmemorable to the extent where many of the Toa sound similar to each other, likely because so many of them share voice actors. Nearly everyone does fine with the material, Akibu's actor in particular seems to be having fun, Gali is finally played by a girl, and the only real negative standout is Umarak's voice after he transforms into the Destroyer. It is too late for you. Feel the power of Makuta! I get he's under mind control, but at least distort his voice more, something more than leaving him as wooden as his neck build. Spoilers, characters aren't all that deep, so we're just running through them now. A side effect of the story being a jumbled, inconsistent mess is that the characters go from what I said earlier, to Tahu being a goof, Onua being wise again, Pohatu being the local tsundere, and Kopaka being an idiot. Liwa, Gali, and Akimu are about the same. The first proper episode starts out by it abruptly with promise. Ikimu just got done upgrading the Toa to their uniter forms, reimagined Nuva forms that even use the same symbols, except when the animators forgot to do their research. They fight off some leftover skull warriors and split up on their quest to find the sacred elemental creatures and their new golden mass. Why are they doing the mass again? Did Akimu really make two different sets of golden mass and hide them around the island? In the midst of this, the Toa and the creatures are being tracked by Umarak, a cunning agent for Makuta. So after acquiring their mass, the Toa gain the ability to unite with their creatures and gain enhanced power, flight, weapons, or whatever Ketar gives Bahatu here. Curiously, Bohatu is treated as the main protagonist of the show, with him having an arc about getting over his aversion to scorpions to use Ketar effectively. Lego has shown many times in the past that they know what a scorpion looks like, so why is this considered a scorpion? Armed with new power and a few visions from the creatures, the Toa race each other to this huge labyrinth that they have some form of familiarity with. They deal with the many traps and puzzles and find the resting place of Makuta's Mask of Control. Unfortunately, Umarak, who had been tailing the group the whole time, steals Ketar breaks into the mask chamber and steals the mask. Bohatu nearly recovers it, but opts to save a fallen Ketar instead, completing his arc. Umarak reports to Makuta and puts on the mask in an attempt to defy him, but gets transformed into Umarak the Destroyer. Now this is well and good, maybe lackluster in a few places, but the series has been fairly serviceable so far. Maybe like six or seven out of ten material. No, uh, not yet, not yet. We're not, we're not scoring yet. <laughs> we're not doing that yet. So the next couple episodes have to be a lead into 2017 story, right? The answer is yes and no. It turns out that the transformed Umarak's mission is to locate the scattered pieces of the final legendary mask, the Mask of Ultimate Power, to free Makuta from the Shadow Realm where the capital city used to be. Not quite sure how a multi-elemental mask can send somebody to such a familiar sounding realm, but sure, let's go with that. Umarak unleashes an army of elemental beasts to distract the Toa, and they take the bait from most of the first episode of the season. These fights are actually not that bad. The creatures stay at the villages to help repel the beasts, while Akimu transforms into this. So you are the Toa of Light. No. Just an old mask maker who'd like to help. This is little more than a reference. He even gets his own creature that we were completely unaware of until now. So the seven heroes go to the big evil mountain, fighting off beasts with unexplained abilities and face off against Jumarak, where they suddenly can't use their elements. Akimu combines with his creature, a gill, in what amounts to a flashbang, and transforms back into his normal self. Gali gets dragged into the Shadow Realm, which looks super spooky. This looks like it'd be leading into the next season, but we have ten minutes left. She sneaks into Makuta's lair while he's busy posturing, and sees on the wall an extension of the oft-repeated Prophecy of Heroes, also known as the backstory, called the Prophecy of Light, 
a prophecy that says in absurd detail that the Toa have to sacrifice themselves to defeat Makuta. Umarak steals the Toa's weapons, tosses them into the portal, and then disintegrates himself, activating the portal to the Shadow Realm without all the Moa pieces. What? G yeah, good, good luck deciphering any of that logic. Gali escapes and fills the other Toa in, saying that they are the elements and that they could have used them all along if they believed. Makuta doesn't even completely escape. The Toa fight him in a battle of lasers. They get the three virtues in the wrong order. Makuta's re-imprisoned, the Toa go back to the sky at the end. What the Garzani just happened? Another cancellation, that's what happened. Though LEGO won't admit to it, sales for Bionicle G2 were abysmal, which might have something to do with the total lack of marketing compared to all the license themes it has going. Because of that, it's readily apparent that the last two episodes underwent severe rewrites to wrap up the story. Worst of all, the Prophecy of Light meant that Free Will apparently doesn't exist, and besides Akimu being awake, the island of Okoto is back at square one. One. The Tar is around, Bakuda's in prison, and his minions are running around the island. Next to nothing got accomplished! That was a complete waste of time! Journey to One is even harder to score because the first three episodes were reasonably solid, with decent action, character animation, and intrigue, making them a reasonable potential introduction to a longer story. I really would give them like a 6 out of 10, with a bunch of nitpicks adding up like iffy voice acting, pacing, and cheesiness. The final episode, on the other hand, was such a status quo obsessed, seat of the pants ridden, nigh on paradic train wreck, its unquantifiably negative score leads me to my score of the reboot as a whole. Overall, I have to give the combined visual story of Bionicle G2, across the animations, and Journey to One, a 2 out of 10. The problems were not that it wasn't the same as the original. It's great that they tried new things, but they're trying so hard to keep things as simple as possible that nobody had anything to latch onto, and thus the story comes across as a long, nonsensical commercial for sets that LEGO Corporate didn't even believe in. The team working on the line itself were clearly trying to make it the best they could, but the wishy-washiness from Corporate meant they didn't have the budget or the plan to truly revitalize Bionicle for a new generation. There is no incentive to care about Bionicle. There is no hype around it outside of the previous established fan base from G1. Granted, the sets released were some of the best ever made, outclassing a lot of G1 sets, but without a story to make people care about who the sets represented, G2 was dead in the water. After the cancellation, I remember seeing tons of skull villains and beasts clogging the Lego aisle. I know this because I was searching for duplicate sets to build the Makuta model seen in the show that never saw an official release, never got proper instructions, and never even got a real mask of ultimate power. This is from Shapeways. And thus ends the entirety of Bionicle. Depending on whether those cryptic posts by Bionicle creator Christian Faber mean anything or not, a storied franchise that eventually forgot that story was what made it a franchise. So that's it for me for now. What do you guys think? Do you see any merit in G2's story at all? How do you think 2017's story could have been handled if it hadn't been cancelled? Let me know in the comments. If you enjoyed this review, leave a like and subscribe for more reviews of anime, video games, movies, and tokusatsu, as well as random exceptions like this. Also hit that bell icon so you know exactly when a new video goes up, and share this video with someone who might find it helpful. Thanks for watching, thanks again for your patience, and thanks for a great two years. This is Brian from MechBlade Studios, signing off.